This is the centre of the module. We're halfway through the, the main lecture in the, in the centre of the module now. We've looked at the structure of the CPU, we've looked at the bits of it, then we looked at the function, we looked at how these things move and change and actually perform computation. So as with most of the lectures, I want to be a little more applied in the second half. We're normally going to look at theory first, then, then some examples. So I want to talk a little bit about the design of instruction sets, first of all. This is how, how do we select what operations a CPU should be, be implementing for us. And then after this, we're going to look at some specific examples. We'll look at this very simple model computer called MARI. It's also a system you'll use in the workshops. Um, and we'll look at the 6502 in, in some more detail. So again, this is classic CPU design up to around 1990. Things get, get more complicated next week um, into the modern era. Okay, so instruction set architecture refers to the design of the, the operations. What operations should a CPU do? For example, should, when we implement addition, should addition only occur between two registers, or should we allow addition between things that are in memory? Okay? So one way to add two numbers of memory is to load them into the registers, do the addition in the registers, and then store the result back out again. Another way to do it is to have a single instruction that says, add the two numbers in memory and put them in another place in memory. You can also make decisions like, should, should the result of that addition be stored in a third register? Should it be stored in one of the original registers? So we might, for example, load a number into register X, a number into register Y, add them together, and the result goes in X. Or you can have an accumulator version of addition where there's only one register. This is like Pascal's calculator. You load the number X into it, and then you load the number Y additionally into it, and that process of adding it in creates the result in a single register. So there you only need one register instead of three. Okay? So instruction set design is a, is a compromise. It's a very difficult design task. Because fundamentally, you are trying to trade off what's good for the CPU, what is good for the hardware, with what is good for the user and what the interface looks like to, to a user. A user is a fairly hypothetical human nowadays. It used to be an assembly language programmer. Nowadays, the user is more abstract. It's probably going to be a compiler or a human writer of compilers, at least. So let's think about what needs to go into an instruction set then. We, we have to be able to command the CPU to do everything that a, a church computer needs to be able to do. So that means you've got to be able to do arithmetic. You've got to have your set of ALU operations. You've got to have commands for moving data. And remember, this movement concept comes from the Babbage machine. It's really more of a copy operator nowadays, but we still call it a move. You know, this is moving things from the, the memory into the CPU. Later on, we'll talk about I.O. You've got to move information from your computer keyboard, for example, to read a character that's been pressed. And then you have operations to do with program control. How are we going to make an if statement? How are we going to test things and jump to places? Um, how are we going to do loops, subroutines, that kind of thing? Um, so in most of these, we've always got to think about where the data is, is being located. So is the input always going to come from a register? Can we assume it's already been loaded? Or can we give instructions that refer directly to stuff in main memory? The same for the output. Is that going to go in a register? Is it going to go in the same register that one of the inputs was in? Is it going to overwrite the stuff in the input? That would get you in trouble on a Babbage machine, because if you've just copied x in from main memory, or you've moved it from main memory, you've lost the fact that x equals 3. You've move the number three, and you've added five to it, and you've got eight, and now you've lost the number three, and you can't use X again. Um, is the data going to be provided with the instruction, or is it going to be loaded in from somewhere else? And this tension, then, is about, if you're the designer, you're going to go to two sets of meetings, and you're, you're, you're going to go to a meeting with the hardware people who are going to implement your instruction set. They're going to run Logisim, or the industrial equivalent of. And they're going to want you to design instructions that are really good for them, instructions that are easily translated into logic, um, that will give rise to efficient digital logic, that will make it cheap. Um, but then you go to the other set of meetings with your users, and they want something completely different. They want an instruction set that is human readable and easy to understand and easy to, to think with. At least in the old days, when, when people used to program in assembly, that, that was the main interface to the machine. That was the thing you were going to sell to your users. 
And these things, as with any kind of interface design, they don't always agree. The hardware people will, will want you to go lower level. The user interface people will often want to go higher level. Um, this process of separating the loading and storing from the arithmetic um, gives right to an ongoing debate known as CISC versus RISC, where you, you have a more complex set of instructions if you allow interaction with memory as part of the addition. But human programmers can like it because it, it makes shorter programs for the human programmers. If you have a more simple, smaller, reduced instruction set, you're going to have a, a longer program, but with fewer different commands in it. So it's, it's both a political balance and a, a technical balance and an understanding users and hardware balance, being an instruction set designer. OK, so as, as with all of these aspects of CPUs, I want to start from Babbage. Um, Babbage clearly planned some kind of instruction set for his analytic engine. Unfortunately, he never wrote down what the commands actually were for the machine. This machine never fully existed. It existed as fragments and different designs and different versions. And it seems like he never thought it was important to define the instruction set at this point. He was more fixated on the, the mechanics of the thing. But we can clearly see there was this, this punch card input, and these would contain some kind of instructions. What Babbage did leave behind was example runs of programs. So he didn't show the commands in the program, but he showed the, the intermediate states of the machine during their execution. It's like stepping through a debugger. Um, so we can kind of infer what the instructions would have been from, from the steps in these programs. This style of writing down algorithms rather than programs is, is very ancient. It goes back to the Babylonians, and we find those um, clay tablets. There are clay tablets with applications of Pythagoras' theorem on them, for example, but they don't list the program. They don't tell you how to compute Pythagoras' theorem. They give you lots of examples. They show the steps in the process. And that's how people used to write down algorithms. The idea of writing down a program is a, a newer development here. Um, Babbage only ever wrote quite small programs, just computing simple mathematical functions. Again, he wanted to illustrate each operation of the machine about <coughs> once and then get back to designing the machine. Whereas Lovelace came in and took the programming idea and really ran with it and created very large programs, the first software engineering. And it's really from her programs that we can make the best inferences about what the instructions would have been. So if we look at them, we see things that look pretty much like the instructions we have today. We see a load instruction. We saw a store instruction. So these would move data from the memory onto the bus into these staging areas. Um, then you would see arithmetic instructions, addition, subtraction, maybe multiplication and division here as well. And these would require taking the data off that storage area, bringing it into one of the simple machines in the ALU, getting it, getting it done and writing it into a, another register somewhere else. And importantly, there was this branch if equal operation. Um, so we still have this today. It's got a standard abbreviation, BEQ, for branch if equal. And this, this is the, the, the if statement. It's saying if the result of the previous operation was zero, then we're going to jump to a different place in the program. Okay, we're going to fast forward to rewind the, the punch cards if the, an output was zero. So this is pretty much what we still have today. We have more, more complex versions of all these, but you can see that the basic structure of it is coming from the analytic engine. Um, we don't have any existing documented program. So this slide is purely a fantasy. This is what the instructions for the analytic engine might have looked like. Um, if we look at other technology of the time, like the Jacquard looms, you know, this is the input to a Jacquard loom. It's punch card representing zero or ones. You can see that the roll is getting, in the case of the Jacquard loom, it only ever gets forward by one. But the point of computing is we can go fast forward and rewind as well. But we might have a little fantasy that the instructions could look something like this. For example, we could give each line of this as an instruction, and we could say the first two bits uh, that could name the instruction. So if you have 00, zero that could be a branch of equal. Zero, 01 might be load, 10 might be add, 11 one, one might be store. Okay, That's just giving you four, four possible instructions. And then the other bits. Um, this is called the operand. This is called an opcode. These are called the operands. Um, they're telling you what it is you want to load or what it is you want to add. 
So for example, we might have two groups of three bits, and each one of these could represent either an address or an actual value. Um, so here, for example, 0, 1 is load. Um, this could be the code for a register. This might be the code for register 2. And this might be the code for memory address 7. So the effect of putting this as a bunch of zeros and ones in that punch card would be to transfer the data from memory address 7 and load it into register 2 inside the CPU. Okay. Um, here we've got another load. So we're going to take the data at memory location 3 and we're going to load it into register 4. Actually, if this is a normal encoding, that should be 0, 1, 0 up there for register 2. There. That would make this one 4. Then we're going to do add. We're going to add the content of register 2 and register 4. So that's 2 and 4. And we might assume that the result of that is getting stored in another, a third register called an accumulator that isn't specified. These are the kind of choices that go into designing an instruction set. And then here we have 1.1. One, one. This is the store command. So we're going to store the contents of the accumulator that's been given a code 0. And we're going to store that at memory location 6. Okay. So this is doing a, a simple addition on the analytic engine. You're bringing in one number, bringing in another number, adding them together, storing the result back out. Okay. So it's a fun exercise to try programming with this kind of thing. Um, this is what Lovelace did using a pencil. Real hackers use pencils, and Lovelace used a pencil to write programs for computing all kinds of things. A simple example would be compute a factorial function only using these operations. Okay. So this is still the structure we have today. We saw the first part of those instructions was what's called an opcode. It's a, a small number of bits that describes what it is you want to do. Which of the instructions is this? Is it a load, a store, an add, a jump, a conditional branch? And then the rest of the instruction contains zero or more operands. So this could be actual data to be manipulated. It could be addresses of things. It could be names of registers. It's saying what it is you want to add, what it is you want to store, where do you want to store it, where do you want to load it from. OK. Um, so a more modern example of this, we'll look a little bit later on at this Marie architecture. Just a preview then. On Marie, uh, you have a 16-bit instruction. The first four bits of that is the opcode. That gives you 2 to the power of 4 is 16 different instructions. Okay. There's a larger instruction set than on this hypothetical analytic engine, but small compared to a, a modern desktop machine. And then you have 12 bits remaining, which can be used for these operands. So for example, you could use this to specify a single 12-bit address in your loads and stores. If you did that, that would give you access to 12 bits of memory space. Okay. So how much memory is that actually going to cover then? That means you can have 2 to the 12 possible locations. This is 4096. That is, we have to call this a kib, kibby word now. You've got not quite 4,000. It's a binary version of 4,000 called a kibby rather than a kilo. You have four, four kibby words of address space. Um, Maria is a 16-bit architecture, which means the content of each of those addresses is another 16 bits. So you have four kibby words times 16 bits each, which gives you 64 kibby bits of memory which is equivalent to 8 kibby bytes, what, what used to be called 8K, but we have to use this, this kibby terminology now. So we'll see the different instructions get different meanings assigned to this, this operand space. And if we're doing a load, so load might be instruction 1. And if we're doing a load, we'll interpret all of this as a single 12-bit address. This says go and find location 50 and load its 16-bit content into a register. If we do a store, the format is the same. Now store is command number two, and we're going to say store the result, assuming it's from the accumulator, into memory location 51. We can do add, like on the Babbage machine. Um, 
Maria, as it happens, is an accumulator architecture, so you don't have to worry about inputs and outputs. You're just going to say, we've already got something in the accumulator. We're going to add whatever's in memory location 52 to what's already in there. Um, or we can say, stop. That's the end of the program. Halt, instruction number seven. In that case, the opcode can be ignored. Here's an example of an execution on Murray. So these are the steps of the program. Let's, let's do the same addition that we did on the Babbage machine. So, okay, here is the first instruction. The program counter is the, the line number of the program in memory, okay? So the program counter starts at zero. So the first thing we do is a fetch, and we're going to take the content of address zero and bring that into the instruction register. These are both internal registers. They're not registers that appear in the assembly code itself. So we copy that instruction in, into the instruction register. Then we're going to decode and execute it. We only show the execution part here. Um, so instruction one is a load. Yeah. When we interpret this, when we decode it, we're going to take that as the opcode and this as the, the operand. So we're going to do a load, and we're going to load from location 050, which is here. And that's going to load in this number three into the accumulator. Accumulator is a user register. OK. Remember, at the end of the fetch cycle, the control unit is set up so that we go, sorry, at the end of the execute stage. The control unit is set up so we go back to doing a fetch again. So it will increment the program counter. That's now pointing to address number one. And now we're going to fetch that one into the instruction register. Okay. Now this is another load command. This is going to load from address 051. That's going to load this value into the accumulator. And remember, it's an accumulator, so that, that process is loading it onto the number that's already there and performing the, the addition in this case. OK, we finished that execution. Increment the program counter again. Now we're on line number two. We're going to load that instruction into the instruction register. And then we're going to execute that. And in opcode number two is the store instruction. So that's going to take the result from the accumulator, and it's going to write it to address number 50. That's the operand given in this instruction. OK? So we loaded in two numbers from two parts of memory, did the addition, all in the accumulator, stored it out at, at one of those memory locations. As it happens, we've overwritten one of the memory locations that we started with, but we could have stored that anywhere. OK? So Murray is a simple educational example. Re real chips have potentially a lot of different ways of doing addressing. We'll talk later about the CISC versus RISC debate. In the RISC school of thought, you have a reduced instruction set, which means you try and make this as simple as possible. So in a reduced instruction set, you have instructions that are doing loading and storing, bringing things into registers, and then you do all your other stuff only on the registers. And that gives you a very small, simple instruction set. Um, if you go the other route, if you go to complex instruction sets, or CISC, you can make lots of different flavors of every command. So for example, addition can have a whole bunch of slight variations of what addition is. So the most basic kind of addition, this is what you get in RISC and CISC, is performed between two registers. So here, this is now not on an accumulator machine. This is a machine with two or more registers. This is saying, take whatever's in register 1 and whatever's in register 2 and add them together. And usually the convention is you store the result in register 1. You could have a version of this with three arguments, where you give a third register as a location to, to put the output. Um, when you get out of RISC and into CISC world, you can do other things. You might, for example, have a single instruction that says, add the content of register 1 to the content of a memory location. Okay. So this is a complex instruction. This is going to combine some fetching with some addition. Okay? Effectively, this is going to get compiled inside the CPU into doing a fetch and then doing an add. Or you can have instructions like this. This is adding an actual number to something in a register. You can say, take whatever's in register 1 and add the number 32 directly into it. Um, or you can do what's called indirect addressing. This sounds obscure, but is actually really useful for a, a whole bunch of, of practical things. Specifically, it's used in implementing languages that have pointers in them. Indirect addressing is when you say, add the content of a register to the content of an address 
which is stored at another address. You got that? So in, in this one, we're going to add the register to whatever's sitting in, in this address over here. In this one, we're going to say, go and look in this address over here. That contains another address, which is over here. Go and get the data out of there and bring that in and add it to what's in the register. Okay? Sounds obscure, actually really useful when you think about pointers and object orientation and, and so on. And particular CPUs will, will add their own favorite instructions to this. So for example, the 6502 has something called zero paging, which allows you to use part of memory as if it was a, a larger set of registers. You can sometimes get offset addressing. This is where you set an offset. You're going to say all the numbers we give in advance are offsets from a particular place in memory. That place is going to live in another register inside the CPU. And then if you say, get me address five, it will be five memory locations away from that one. So there's a whole bunch of architectural design decisions that can be made there, which enable different kinds of languages to be compiled easily and efficiently um, to get implemented down here. Okay, so another design decision is whether to use accumulators. Um, an accumulator is a special type of register. Um, it's given a special status. Everyone knows that register is the accumulator. And then the assumption is you can give instructions which don't specifically say which register they're acting on. They will all act on the accumulator. So for example, if you say add 0F8D, um, that will bring in the content of memory from that location. That's a 6502 style address, 16 bits, being four nibbles, yeah, four hex characters. That will bring that in, and it will add it to whatever is already in the accumulator. You're not <coughs> specifying that the target of that is the accumulator. You're not specifying the second input, and you're not specifying the output. And this is the style you get on many calculators. If you use a, a pocket calculator and you say plus five, you're giving this kind of instruction. A, a calculator is based around an accumulator. That's the number that you see displayed on the screen at each step. So if you have some number there in the accumulator, you do plus five, and it adds it to the accumulator, and the result is stored in the accumulator. Um, it's the same structure you see in Pascal's calculator, where we loaded a number onto the calculator, then we add on the second number, and it's all done in a, a single place. So an advantage of accumulator architectures is it can make your instruction set very simple, because you don't need all these extra arguments. It's going to make your chip design simpler, because you don't have to decode all these extra arguments. You, you know that everything's just going to go into the accumulator. So you're going to have instructions like this. They're going to have the opcode that just says add, and then it could either have the number of a register or it could have an address in location, and everything else is going to happen in the accumulator. OK, another common design decision, you don't have to do this, but many CPUs do, is provide a hardware stack and extra instructions to manipulate the stack. So have you done stacks in your algorithms class? Okay. The stack is a data structure like a physical pile of paper. You can put things on the top of the stack, you can pop them off the stack, but you can't access things inside the stack very easily. Um, so you can do these completely in software, as you'll do in data structures in algorithms classes, but they get used so frequently at assembly language level that many CPUs decide to give a fast hardware implementation of them. Um, so to do this, you have to dedicate part of your main memory as the stack area. Um, again, in the 8-bit area, there, there was always a stack and there was always a heap, and you had to know which of these things you were, you were putting things on. And if you, if you used up all your 32K of memory, they'd grow and grow and grow, and then they'd hit each other in the middle, and, and bad things would happen. Um, this is known as a stack overflow. There's a popular website named after this. So to implement a stack, you're going to have your dedicated part of memory. This is where my stack lives. And then we're going to have a list of memory locations in that space. Um, and this is the stack pointer, the stack pointer register. So we know where each of these chunks of that stack area exists. Um, we're going to have instructions to push things and pop things on that stack. So you might have an assembly language instruction like PHA that's going to push whatever is in the accumulator onto the hardware stack, or you can pop things off of it again. 
and you'll typically set up your digital logic inside the chip to look after the stack pointer automatically. Okay, so we have an extra register in the chip called the stack pointer. Every time I push something, that's going to write it into that bit of memory, and it's also going to increment the stack pointer automatically so that it's ready to store something in the next one. If we do a pop, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to decrement the stack pointer, and it's going to read the, the data from the, the memory being pointed to. So this comes up in a lot of applications that are driving it, getting implemented in, in hardware then. Um, so originally, a, a good use was just if you ran out of registers, you're trying to get a lot of data in your CPU, you want to put it somewhere else, you can start shoving stuff on the stack um, instead of shoving it in main memory. And typically, the stack area is going to be set up so that that part of memory is faster, um, if you can figure out how to do that in the, the logic level. Um, but they really get used for function calls and to enable structured programming. So if you're doing any language with subroutines or functions or procedures or whatever you want to call them, you have this notion that you're partway through your code and you're going to jump to this other place, a function or a method, they call them now, in object-oriented languages. Um, you're going to jump to inside this method or this function and you've got to remember where you were and you've got to remember the states of all the variables that were in that part because you're now going to go to this other place and this has its own variables and depending on the semantics of your language you might not be able to see the ones that you had in the, the old place. But they're still there because you have to go back when you return from the, the subroutine or the method or whatever it's called nowadays. So it turns out to be useful to add instructions at the architectural level to enable this. You typically see instructions like this. JSR is for jump to subroutine. So that will not just do a go to to that part of your program, but it will also manipulate the stack and the stack pointer to enable you to come back. It will remember where you were push that address on the stack. And then you can pop it back. You can take, take it off the pile, and that will take you back to where you were. So you can see this structure of, say, a functional programming language where you've got 10 functions that all call each other. It, it builds a nest of functions, and the location of each one of those is put on the stack. And then you're going to take them off to climb back up as you come out. Um, at the hardware level, the stack is also required for operating systems to function. Um, you have another module on operating systems, but they'll talk about this context switching um, where you have more than one program is running at the same time. And when it's time to stop this program running and go and run another one for a bit, you want to remember what it was doing, and you can use the stack to shove all that information on and go and run the other program for a while. So it's similar. At this level, it's a very similar process to doing a function call. You have to remember a context and everything that was going on there and have the ability to, to go back to it. Okay. Um, when we give all of these instructions, we typically don't write in zeros and ones. The easiest way to understand it at the hardware level is the zeros and ones. Think about the, the punch card input. These are the actual zeros and ones. Um, this is called machine code that is going, going into the machines. Um, as we said, instruction set design is partly a human process, less so than it used to be, but still somewhat. You have to make the programming language for your CPU somewhat understandable by humans. So humans don't really like to type instructions like this. It's easy to make mistakes. It's not easy to understand what they do. So there's a distinction then between the machine code, which is the actual zeros and ones, those words containing an opcode and an operand. And the stuff that we write, or rather the stuff that our compilers generate, which tends to look like this. You have actual text instructions, like a load command, an add command, a store command. Now, this is load 50. All of these are ASCII characters. I don't know if anyone's done a Unicode-based assembler yet. Maybe they used to be ASCII code characters. Um, the machine doesn't implement ASCII commands. You're going to write this in a text file. Literally, open notepad, write these commands in the text file, and then you're going to run a, a small, simple program called an assembler, which just translates this ASCII text into actual zeros and ones, or in this case, decimal digits. Um, this, these are instructions for Mary, which is decimal. 
So there's a precise one-to-one -one relationship here. This isn't a compiler. It's not doing anything clever with your code. It's literally translating the word load into a one and then translating that 50 into 50 or the command store into two and 50 into 50. It's a one-to-one -one translation. So in, in theory, it's very simple to, to write an assembler. <coughs> to actually do this then, you can write your assembler code in Notepad. You're going to run an assembler program like the GCC compiler has an assembly part of it. Um, that will generate a file containing zeros and ones, which is called an executable file. Um, on some proprietary operating systems, I believe they're called .exe files for executable. Um, the executable file is what actually gets run. And there's a process to make it run on your, on your computer. How do you actually get your CPU to start running a program? Well, in the old days, it was easy. You used to have a little program called the loader, and that would take the file containing the zeros and ones. It would copy the file into a chunk of memory. You'd tell it the address of the first memory location, and it would copy it all there. And then it would set the program counter of your CPU to point to the first word in your program. And then the CPU would go off and do its thing. Um, so on the BBC Micro, you do that with something like star run. That would do a mixture of loading it and running it, as opposed to just loading it. Uh, nowadays, it's a little more complicated. Um, these programs often call one another. You probably have multiple executable files. One of them is the main executable. The others are called library files, uh, or shared object files, or DLLs. Um, and you're going to load a whole bunch of these things together. And you have to make them able to call each other. If I've got a library with a hello world function in it, I need my program to know where the hello world function actually is. So a modern loader is going to do a lot of tweaking of addresses to make sure that all these libraries are brought in and connect. Um, a modern loader is also having to deal with the operating system and the fact that you're running on virtual memory rather than, than real memory. And it has to make conversions and talk to the operating system and so on. It has to tell the operating system that a new process has started. But you can learn about that in your, your operating systems class instead. OK. So that was instruction set design. Um, I want to look at some specific applied examples of, of this stuff now. Um, Mary is the simplest one. This is what we're going to use in the workshops. Um, Mary is not a real CPU. It doesn't, as far as I know, no one's made a silicon version of it. You could do, if anyone fancies a second year, third year project. <laughs> But it exists primarily in simulation as a, a learning tool. Um, it's a 16-bit machine. All the data words are 16-bit. It's an accumulator architecture, so it only has one user register, the accumulator. That makes things very easy. It's all using binary. It's using the two's complement data representation to represent negative numbers. Um, everything is an integer. Um, there's no float floating point or ASCII characters or anything. You've got an ALU, and you have these 16-bit instructions, of which the first four are the opcode, and the, the other 12 are for, for the operand. That's what gives you this eight kibby bytes of addressing. Um, I.O. is heavily simplified. They model a single input register and an output register. So if you press a key on your keyboard, that will generate a, an integer corresponding to the ASCII character of the key you pressed. And so you can just read the keyboard, and it will give you that integer. It's very, very simple. And the same, the same for printing things out on the screen. OK, this is the structure of, of Murray. Um, you can see here's the control unit. There's a program counter. That's where we are in the program. Instruction register, copy of the current instruction. Here's ALU. Here's the accumulator. Um, you have these memory address register and memory buffer register. These are like the, the staging areas in the, the Babbage architecture. One's saying, which bit of memory do I want to read or write? What's the address? And the other one's storing the, the value that's been read in. Um, so they're just needed to make the, the process of input-output go smoothly um, when you're talking to main memory. You've got a 12-bit program counter. Remember, addressing here is all, is all 12 bits. That comes from using 16-bit instructions with the first four getting used for opcode. So you, everything has 12 bits of address left over. Um, and you have this very simplified input and output registers of eight bits each. And they're eight bits because that enables you to put in ASCII codes. Very simple instruction set designed to be simple for teaching and learning. You can do load, store, add, just like the analytic engine. You can do subtract. You can 
read these input and output ASCII codes. So they, they come in as integers. There's no concept of the ASCII letter itself, only the integer. You've got a whole, and importantly, you've got the skip con. This is the equivalent of the branching instruction from the analytic engine. Again, this is made very simple. It just says, if something is zero, skip one line of the program. So it doesn't even have a go-to. It just says, skip a single line. So typically, you, you're going to use this by following that with one or more jump commands. Yeah. If, if the thing is zero, you're going to jump to the, the line from two commands down. And if it's not zero, you'll, you'll go to the next line and jump somewhere else from there. And that's done with the, the final jump command, number nine. There's a nice simulation of Mari. This is what you'll be using in the workshop. This shows you the content of memory. Okay. These are all the addresses in hex space. You can see these are 16-bit words for hex characters. Um, this shows you the program being run. Remember, the program is stored in the same memory as the data because it's a von Neumann architecture. A way to get horribly confused is to try and execute data when you should be executing code, um, unless you really know what you're doing or if you're hacking. And then we can see the, the status of each of the registers, the accumulator, instruction register, MAR, MBR, PC, input register. Okay. So this is a very nice way to learn a, a simple form of assembly programming, where all the, the nasty bits have been taken out. A more advanced way to learn assembly programming is not to go straight to a modern Intel, but to take something like your, your favorite 8-bit, the 6502, and have a little hack around with this. So again, the 6502 is just it's right on the threshold of being comprehensible by humans. When they designed this, they designed it with tapes and pens, and the whole design did fit in about three people's heads. And as a modern student, you can just about understand the whole structure of the chip. I think if you go to anything beyond this, no human being is going to understand a, a much bigger chip. A modern Intel chip is designed by teams of probably thousands of people, and they all know how one little bit works. Um, and really, no one has a clue how they interact, which is why we end up with horrible bugs like Meltdown and Spectra. But in a system like this, you can just about see, see what's going on. So in the 6502, this is more complex now. We've got three user registers. We've got an uh, accumulator. We've got an X register and a Y register, and they're all 8-bit. Addressing is done with 16-bits, okay, which gives you 64 Kibby bytes of addressable memory. Um, the BBC Micro only had 32, but you could, in theory, have upgraded it to 64. Um, and very famously, the 16-bit addresses are always written like this. They're, they're written as four capitalized hex characters with an ampersand in front. When you turn the 6502 on, it defaults to having these two address locations stored in the program counter. This tells you where in memory you're going to start running your program. So if you want the machine to boot up and do something, you're going to put your program at that address. I think in Mari, it's always zero. It always initializes to zero. But for any CPU, it's important to know where, where the whole thing starts so that you can do anything. There's a stack pointer implemented here. This is going to enable um, procedural languages like BBC Basic to be implemented nicely. And there's a whole bunch of these status bits. You remember that the ALU has this extra output saying, did anything go wrong? Did anything interesting happen? Was the result zero that you're going to condition on? So you get seven of those. The reason we have this particular choice of registers is to enable 16-bit addressing. So typically, you're going to use the accumulator for doing arithmetic. And you're going to use x and y as the two halves of a 16-bit memory location. Okay? So this is. This is proper old school. To, to define an address, you've got to do two loads. You load the first byte of the address into one register and the second byte of the address into the second register. And then you have stuff that's going to look at the pair of registers together and interpret that as an address and do a, do a load from it. Whatever. It's a lot easier nowadays. You just say load from the, the whole 16-bit address. Memory mapping was very understandable. We'll talk more about I.O. later in the module. But roughly every kind of input and output was mapped directly to a memory location. 
Okay, so there'd be something like you know, F zero A three, and that would represent a pixel on the screen. So if you if you wrote to that address, you'd see the pixel instantly go yellow or whatever number you put in there. Similarly, every key on the keyboard would be mapped to an address. So if you press a key, that part of memory will go high, and you can read it and see if the key's been pressed. So a lot of the address space was taken by these. These, these standard components. You'd physically have other chips plugged into the bus. These were ROM chips. They could contain functions, or they could contain data that was getting changed by something else. So that the keyboard will exist in part of the address space. You can read it and see what's on the keyboard. Other ROM chips would have functions programmed into them already. So you could call a function at a known ROM location um, and know that you get a, a print command or something. So we had 8-bit opcodes. We'll talk more about those next lecture. That gives you 256 possible instructions. Not all of them are used. Quite a lot of them were. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail. This is just an example of some 6502 code. You can say just the same kind of stuff as in all the other machines, including the analytic engine. We've got commands like load to accumulator. LDA means load to accumulator. If you do LDX or LDY, that will load into the other two registers. Um, we've got stack instructions. We can push and pop from the stack. And we've got various arithmetic instructions. You can do addition. Here we're using the, the shifting. We're rotating left and, and rotating right to do this fast uh, multiplication and division. Um, and then you have branching statements, like a BNE, for example, is branch if not equal. Okay? If, if something is, is not equal to zero, then, then you're going to go and do the branch. So we'll talk more about the details of this instruction set in, in the next lecture. There's a list of some of the more famous examples over here. So unlike a modern CPU, this is an assembly language that was designed to be human writable, and it was designed to be fun to be human writable. This was designed for human programmers to write video games in. Um, nowadays, it's much more common for the assembly to be targeted by a compiler or by the human writers of the compiler. But this is from a time when you, this was the interface. This was part of the product you were selling to your users, and you had to make a, a beautiful and fun and enjoyable instruction set for them to play with. So just, just to show how much has, has changed in 100 and however many years, um, <laughs> this is how we did addition in 1836. You would load something, uh, load a value into a register, load another value into a register, add them, store the accumulator out in memory and stop. This is how you do it on Mari, load, add, store. Um, this is how you do it on a modern Intel machine, like the one on this desk. You can see that the move command has this history from Babbage. It's, it's really a copy rather than a move. But it's pretty much the same. You put things in the registers, you add them, and you, you stop. OK. Um, How's everyone's reading coming along? Is everyone reading a chapter a week? Yeah, you have to read a chapter a week. Loads of people are still asking about the exam. What is examinable is anything in the lectures, anything on the slides, anything in the workshops, and anything on these recommended reading slides. We're not going to examine. I'm uploading a few fun things on Blackboard as well, like some of the original historical papers. Those are not examinable. But if it's in the lectures, workshops, or recommended reading slides, it's examinable. Question? Uh, is it only one of those? Yeah. Thank you.